Okay, so let's try to do this. Uh, do this uh, fairly quick. So this this uh, this is basically the beginning of the lab part. I'm going to close down ArcMap and save it, and then open up this week's lab. I'll kind of talk about uh, what we're going to do this week. A little different, but we're still going to use a lot of the same uh, concepts that we've already that we've already done. But we're also going to introduce Model Builder. Who's used Model Builder before in, in other classes? Some of you. Okay. All right. Um, so we're going to use Model Builder today. Now, we're only going to use Model Builder on a couple more labs, uh, and then we're going to transition and we're going to use... Um, we're going to use the uh, the raster function chains for a couple of labs, and then finally toward the end, we're going to use Python for a couple of the labs. Now, like I said, I'm not going to teach you everything about Python in this course, uh, but it'll be more like cutting and pasting things into the Python window. Uh, so we're going to cover all three ways of doing things, um, and uh, and this isn't meant to be a totally complete. I learn everything about Model Builder in this class. So if you want to learn more about Model Builder, remember there are ways to do that uh, in uh, our in the uh, in the virtual campus, which you all should have access to now. So, so if you want to learn more about Model Builder, go on to virtual campus and uh, sign up for the courses. You don't even need me to, to let you sign up for them anymore. That that's the way it's set up. Okay. All right. So let's, uh, let's create this um, uh, in ArcGIS Pro. We're going to create a new blank project for week two. So I opened up ArcGIS, ArcGIS Pro, and I'm going to hit blank. And it doesn't matter where you save it down here. This is up to you, <laughs> wherever you have enough room. But I'm going to call this uh, SA underscore week, or I'm just going to call it EX for exercise two. I haven't downloaded the data yet, so I should probably do that. And then I'm going to hit OK. So it's going to go in, it's going to set up. And one of the things that's really good is it sets up its own database for output. Another thing that's really good is it sets up its uh, own uh, toolbox, which we're using Model Builder today, so we need a toolbox. Right? Before I get too far, I should have already downloaded the data, but I didn't, so I will do that. Many of you probably already did this, but if you didn't, go to the, the Lab 2 link, click on it, and then select the link to the data and text. And then open that. And what you're going to get here is something you might not expect. It's a bunch of shape files. I'm going to put this on uh, C. I'm going to create a new folder. I'm going to call this SA, stands for Spatial Analysis, and just paste it in there. It doesn't matter where you put it, just remember where you put it. So this is where I put it. I put it in C, SA, EX2. That's where I put the, the data. Now, is this, a, is this a file geodatabase like the Laguna Beach database? No. This is a bunch of shapefiles in a directory. And shapefiles are a different file format. They're an older file format than file geodatabase. Um, but they're actually very similar as to how they store things on uh, conceptually. So they're, they're, they're still, this vector data is stored as a bunch of tables uh, with polygons, points, or lines. Okay. So you don't, you don't uh, the first thing we want to do is add a new map. And the lab, I'm going to walk you through the, for the first part of the lab. So the lab has you... Uh, create a new map, which you did in the last lab too. This time we're only going to create one map. So we created one map, we got the map. Now if we go over into databases, we don't see the data we just downloaded. We do see this. This is an empty geodatabase that it just created. We're going to keep that the home geodatabase because it's going to store any of our outputs. Also, it doesn't it doesn't uh, enter folders, we don't see the data there. Okay. If we want to see the data over here in the catalog pane, then we have to connect that folder into our project. The way we can do that is right-click and say Add Folder Connection. 
Now we can go to that place. Remember I stored it in C. I stored it in SA. I don't see SA. This is the same problem I just had, right, with, with Nick. What's the problem? Refresh. So I hit refresh, and now it will show up. I'll be able to see SA. So ArcGIS Pro is a lot worse than Arc Map was at that. It seems like if, if you create it, after you open up ArcMap, it won't be there. So you have to hit refresh. So now I'm just going to, once I click on, on my EX2 folder, I'm going to hit OK. And once I do that, now I can see everything in that EX2 folder in my project. Go ahead every once in a while and hit save to save your project. So I'm going to hit save. I'm going to save my project. Now my project saved. If I close it and open back up, I don't have to reestablish that link. Now, it didn't move that EXT, just, just to let you know, it did not move that EXT, sorry, EX2 folder. It just put a reference to that folder so that I have a shortcut to it. So, so if I wanted to store it in the same folder as the project, I would have had to remember where the project was. But that's not really important to save it in the same location, especially for this lab. So we've got these four input data sets, agriculture, industrial areas, roads, and towns. I'm going to add them to the view. When I add them to the view, ArcGIS Pro automatically zooms to that area and changes the reference projection so that it's the same projection as the data. Now, this is not raster data, but in this lab, we're going to calculate all the factors are the distance from these different rest, uh, from these different uh, data sets. So uh, we're going to create raster data as the first step. We're going to convert these from uh, raster, I mean, sorry, from vector to raster by finding the distances. All right. Um, you don't have to do this, but uh, I'm going to. Um, I'm going to get rid of this topographic one, and I'm going to add a new base map. I'm just going to add the light gray canvas base map. Okay. And then I think the towns kind of conflicts with the uh, other, so I'm going to change the symbology. So I click on, click on the blue, the symbol, and then I go back and I choose the symbol I want. Well, that's that was already there. I don't want 3D symbols. I get oh properties. So if I go into properties under format point symbol, I just choose the to change the color. I want it to be like maybe I'll do the points in red because there's no other red on the map. So now all of my symbols are different just for, for personal preference here. The other thing that you must do for this lab, and I talk about this a little bit, is zoom out to a position where you've got the entire study area that you want. Something like that. I got the entire study area. All right. Mm. Mm. I'm going to open up the, uh, the exercise here. So, um, in the end, you create a map that shows the areas that are least suitable for the target activity nature conserve, preserve. The reason that they're the least suitable is that they are close to these, these things that we don't want in nature preserves. Okay? So our nature preserve is our target activity. So our inputs will be, uh, sorry, that says three layers. It's actually four layers. Towns, roads, industrial areas, and agriculture. So if we're near towns, roads, or industrial areas, or agriculture, then it's not an appropriate uh, area to put a nature preserve. Okay. So we're going to, um, 
we're going to basically use this table to come up with um, a, a, uh, a factor rating score for each of these layers. So we've got these layers, um, and what, what has to happen is that, um, is that uh, these, these are the influence distances. So anything that's within 3,000, um, I think it's meters, meters of a town is not as suitable as other areas. Anything that's within 2,000 meters of roads is not suitable. Anything that's within 3,000 meters of an industrial area is not suitable. And finally, anything within 5,000 areas of agriculture is not as suitable. So what happens is that the suitability, the degree of unsuitability, actually tails off as we get away from the center. And at, for agriculture, anything that's 5,000 feet, 5,000 meters away or more is totally suitable. It's not, it's not at all unsuitable. Anything that's beyond 3,000 in industrial areas is totally suitable. It's not unsuitable at all. But anything that's from 0 to 3,000 on a linear basis is unsuitable. So it starts out at being totally unsuitable right inside of an industrial area or an agriculture area, and it slowly goes out at a linear rate. I've put the formula for the linear rate here, so you don't have to calculate it by hand, uh, or you don't have to figure that out. So we'll, 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 we'll do that in the lab. Okay. All right. So mine doesn't look exactly like this right now because different colors. So what we need to do is that we need to, to create a model that implements this suitability uh, model that we've just created. So C, here's this, and we're going to use a model builder. So if we go to, yeah, we're, we're doing good on the analysis. If we go to um, analysis and we choose a model builder, it will create a new, as soon as we hit model builder, it creates a new model for us. Now, where did it put that model? Let's go over to Geo, uh, sorry, let's go over to the catalog, go to toolboxes, and that's where it put the model right there. That's a model, and that model is stored. This toolbox is stored in that location of our project, and this model is stored in that toolbox. So, one of the things that you have to turn in is this toolbox, which will now contain that model. Okay. So the first thing that we want to do, the lab talks about this, is rename this model Habitat Suitability Model. So we're going to right click on it and say Properties, and here's the name. Now, I said in the lab to name it Habitat Suitability Model, but I forgot to mention that you can't have spaces in model names. See that it got red? So what you need to do is either take the spaces out or replace them with underscores. That's what I'm going to replace them with underscores. So now it says habitat suitability model. Oh, it doesn't even like underscores. I'll just take them out. There we go. So then the name is habitat suitability model, but the label, that's what I mean. That's what will actually show up. So when I hit OK here, See how it changes it? And you'll, well, refresh. Maybe I, maybe I have to hit save. Yeah, OK, I have to hit save. So what you actually see here and here is the label. So we, that can have spaces in it. But the actual name of the model cannot have spaces in it. I don't, I'm not sure what the reasoning is, but uh, that's, that's the way it is. So now we have this blank canvas. And we haven't done this so far. That's why we're doing this together. We have this blank canvas. And this blank canvas is an area where we can chain tools together. So we can, 
we can run various tools and get the output. And so um, the, the lab walks you through this, but what we need to do is for each of these data sets, we need to calculate the distance uh, away from those data sets. So we need to calculate, use the Euclidean distance tool to arrive at values from zero to however far the farthest value is apart. Okay. So we need to run Euclidean distance four times. And the Euclidean distance is just going to output, every cell is going to represent how far every cell is away from a town. And then in the next data set, it's going to represent how far every cell is away from roads. And how far every uh, cell is away from industrial areas. And how far every cell is away from agricultural areas. And each of these is, each of, each of those outputs, how far away everything, those are the factors. So the next step is to create the ratings map. Okay? And I have the formula for creating the ratings map. So first you're going to create the factors, then you're going to create the ratings map, and then finally you're going to do a cell statistics to overlay all the ratings maps together. And you'll have your result. Okay? I don't actually have the uh, the diagram of what the whole thing looks like, but this is this is the process by which you take all the uh, raw data and convert it to the factor data set. In other words, the distance data set. And then the ratings data set function is just going to be a, um, a raster calculator expression. So here's a raster calculator expression. It's going to look like this. So let's walk through that part together. Okay, we'll, do, we'll do this lab mostly together, and I'll just leave the last part, the cell statistics part, uh, for you to do, uh, to do by yourself. Okay? So what we need to do is we need to put on this canvas the tools that we need. So the first one is that distance tool. Uh, so I searched for it previously, but uh, let's try to find it this time because we found out where it was. Under spatial analysis, distance, Euclidean distance. Oops. I didn't mean to click on it. Click on it, it opens it like as if I want to run it. I want to drag it onto here. So this represents the case where I want to run a data set through this tool. Okay. Euclidean distance is the name of the, uh, of the tool that I want to run, and these are the outputs that it creates. I never really mentioned this output. It's not necessary for this lab, um, but some tools actually create multiple outputs. Uh, usually they're secondary or they're used less often. The primary output is this one. This is the output distance raster. Um, that's the one that I was talking about where every cell represents the distance back to the source. Okay? Here, the output direction raster represents the direction back to the source. So that's not really that's something we really care about in this example, but it might be in another question. Okay. Unfortunately, in, the, in, uh, in ARC Map and Model Builder, you could delete this, but you can't delete it in ARC, uh, in ARC GIS Pro. Um, if you delete it, um, it deletes the whole function. So we're just going to leave it empty because it is optional. If I click on this, then I get, that's, that's this tool. When it runs in the model, it's going to do this. Okay? Um, and you can see that the output direction raster uh, is optional. We don't have to put anything in there. I'm, I'm not going to because we don't need it. We don't need it to create that. Okay? All right. So what I want you to do is to right-click on the Euclidean distance data set and say create variable from parameter input or feature source data. So what we're doing is we're creating a new bubble for one of the inputs. Now if you double click on that, it'll allow you to specify what you want that to be. And we want it to be sounds. 
Now, if you want, if you want to generalize your models in the future, like in other words, if you wanted to let them choose which data set represented the towns for your particular model, you can right click on the word towns here and make that a model parameter. What this means, if I hit save here, what this means is if I try to run this, I go back to uh, catalog, and I try to run this from here, now, now I'm allowed to choose the data set that represents towns. So why would this be useful? Well, if I wanted to run this same model, once I build the model out, if I wanted to run it in Mississippi or Europe or wherever, I could choose the towns data set that represented European towns or Mississippi towns, but the model would be the same. So it allows the model to be portable. Okay? So um, that's what that does. I can, I can rename this at this point. That's just a label. So if I want this, if I'm going to rename this, and call it like, you know, Towns data set. If I save that, I have to reopen this in order for it to work. Oops, catalog. Now it says Towns data set. That's just a label at this point. It doesn't matter. It's holding a variable. It's holding a value, which is the Towns data set in, by the way, this is in Jamaica. I don't know if I mentioned this before. Towns data set for this watershed in Jamaica. So it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna take the town's data set, calculate the Euclidean distance, and it's going to make a new raster that is the distance away from for every cell, the distance away from a town. At any point, if you actually want to run this, you can. You can hit validate and then run, and it's going to run it. Um, you can't see it in the map unless you then add the data to the map. So you can hit add data, and then remember that it's in your database. That's the default place it puts it. So it's in there. There it is. I hit OK. And now, Let's turn off the other layers real quick, just for fun. What do the values in this raster represent? The highest value, look, is like 10,925. What's that represent? The highest value. The furthest away from a town that you can get, which is right there. That's the furthest away from a town that you can get. There it is. So we're, not, we're, we're really far away from towns there. You can see there's a little kind of like ridge line in the data because you know this is between two towns. Same between these two towns. You can see this little ridge line right there. These are these are distances between towns and so on. So this is every cell represents the distance away from a town. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of that. I don't I don't need it right now. And go back to my habitat suitability model. Oh, uh, actually I don't know if I can do undo. I'm going to add that back in just a second. So, what's the extent of this raster data set? We can see it. There's not any no data. The extent of this raster data set, what do you, why do you think it shows that to be the extent? What does it look like? If I show you those two data sets at the same time, the towns and the, the, the Euclidean distance, what did it do? Where did it cut the where did it cut off the Euclidean distance data set, the raster data set? Yeah, it's the extent of the towns. Right? So when you do raster, remember you always have to think about what cell size it's coming up with, and you have to think about uh, the extent that it's going to come up with. So yes, it, it, it's the extent of the towns. Now, look at where the industrial areas are, right? So I have this problem because when I run industrial areas, the extent of industrial areas is just going to be right here. There's going to be some areas where the industrial uh, 
areas data set exists where the Euclidean distance, I mean, sorry, where the town's Euclidean distance data set doesn't exist and vice versa. Okay? There's a larger area where this data set's not going to exist. So if I want to combine these data sets, I want them to have the same extent. So I need to, without the, uh, without having a data set that represents my study area, which would probably be ideal, the other way to do this is when I'm running this process to instead, I'm going to run it one more time, and instead of choosing the, um, the default, I'm going to go under environment, and I'm going to say that the extent is going to be the current display extent. So now, when I run this guy, I'm going to get a data set that shows me the Euclidean distance. I'll probably have to add it back in. It doesn't look like it added it back in by default. I'll have to add that back in and see now it goes over this entire area. Ideally, you'd probably want to have a data set that represented your study area. Just a box. But in the absence of that, I've just chosen this area. I tell, I tell you to do that in the lab. And I also actually tell you to choose a cell size of 100. Just so it, uh, it processes a bit faster. So, see, if I, if I choose 100 here, you'll see that when I do that, uh, you'll actually be able to see the cells. See how, see how, fast, how much faster it processed? It, it, was, it was really quick. You know, just... And because it's a lot smaller on disk. So now you can, you can kind of, it's actually, you can't see it much, but the, the cells are a little bit bigger, so it processes a little bit faster. Okay. So I'm going to remove that, and I'm going to go back to my habitat suitability model. So what I need to do is I need to do this four times. In your model, you can, you can zoom out. Okay, whoa. So I got, I've done, oops, I've done that once. Actually, there's no reason to move. I could have just like scrolled. Okay, so now I want to, um, to run Euclidean distance again and again and one more time. Okay, I'm running it four times, right? So what I need to do in here is each time I need to do the same thing I did before. Right click, say create variable from parameter, input. But each time I choose a different input, I'm going to choose roads this time. And I'm going to make this a parameter. And then I'm going to create variable from parameter, input. I'm going to make this a parameter. And I'm going to make this the third one that's not roads, it's going to be industrial areas. And then I'm going to do this one more time with which data set is left? Agriculture, right? Set that to agriculture. Now, the other thing that's kind of a gotcha that you need to, to pay attention here to is that hover over each of these and make sure it's a unique name. See how that says Euclidean distance underscore one, underscore shape one? Now, it'd be great if that was uh, if that was some better name, right? Like whatever you want. So that's two. That's three. Or no, that's two as well. He does this all the time in uh, in our cal I mean, in uh, model builder. So see how those all have the same name? That won't do. If you, if you do that, what's going to happen is it's going to run this, and then it's, and this one has a different name be okay because that was one. If you run this, that's, a, that's okay. But then when it, start, when it runs this one, it's actually going to overwrite the output for the last one. That's not going to work. Okay? So that's why I think it's best to go in and give these each unique names. So you could call these, you know, like EU or dis, dis towns, dis roads for distance. They don't need to be uh, really big names because they're not the final output. So you don't need them to be names that other people would understand because actually they won't even be only the final outputs by default RTIS only stores the final output. 
the thing at the very end of the model. But you do need them to be unique because if they're not unique, it overwrites them. And then when it goes to do the next step, it will use the same as the very last one to run. And that wouldn't work. Okay? It, and now, look, here's another thing to point out. If I right click and say rename here, I'm changing the name of the variable. That's not the same as changing the data set name. So the variable, don't change that. Change the name of the data set. Double click on it and choose a different data set. So um, I'm going to call this EU disk because that's a default. And instead of underscore shape, I'm just going to change this to towns. Okay? And then I'm going to do the same thing here. Instead of shape two, I'm going to call this roads. Okay, so now it's going to save it on disk as a different name. Click again. And instead of shape two, which would have overwritten, this is actually industrial areas. So I'm just going to call this IA for industrial areas because I can't spell at all. And I don't, don't even know how to spell industrial unless I looked it up. So I don't want to type all that out. So um, then finally with this one, it's agriculture, which I'm just going to call AG. Okay. So now they each have a, a different name. And if I zoom in here, when you change the output name, it will change the this name by default. See how it changed that? Okay. Now, if you do the opposite, it's not true. I could decide, oh, I want it to actually say the nice word. Go in here and, and change this. Uh, and say agriculture, call this distance. Okay. So if I change the name of the variable, now if I highlight over this, it didn't change the name of the data set. So if you change the name of the data set, it'll update the, the variable name, but not the opposite. That's because it's meant to put a, to put a nice word here if you want. You can put whatever you want as the name of the actual file on disk. This isn't that important, though. Okay? The name on the file on disk is important. They all have to be unique. So I'm not going to update any more of these other ones. Okay? But I'm trying to explain that the name of the model builder variable doesn't matter on disk. It's just for your or whoever else is using the model's benefit. Name on disk does matter. Now, see, these all say Euclidean distance two, three, four, whatever. That's fine. You can leave those there. Um, but you could change those as well. You could call them Euclidean distance. You could write out step two or step three. All right. Um, you can hit this auto layout button, which will kind of line them up a little bit uh, better. This is almost what it, I did here, except for I did it before I turned everything uh, green. I mean, uh, turned everything colored. Now, when it's colored like this, when it, when it has colors and it's not gray, that means it's ready to run. So now, if I hit save and I uh, hit validate and run, it would run. The problem is, if I run it from here, if I run it from pressing the run button, I can't change any of the environments. So if I actually want to run this and change the environment variables, I have to go back to uh, the catalog and double click this. Now, in ArcGIS Pro, I don't like how the save button isn't, doesn't change once I save it. But if you, don't, if you don't save it, it won't update. So you do have to remember to hit save. Otherwise, any changes you made since the last time you hit save won't matter when you try to run it here. I'm going to hit Habitat Suitability Model. I can leave all the defaults because these are the actual layers I want to run. But if I did, like, let's say I got a new towns data set, then I could choose that new towns data set. All right, under Environments, I'm going to change the default extent to be the current display extent. I'm going to choose the uh, cell size to be 100. And I'm going to run. So now, watch when it runs. I can actually show the results as it's running here. It's running each of those models. So now it's running three, now it's running four, and now it's done. So it ran, it ran all of those. 
I can I can go back over to the catalog and look at the outputs here if I hit refresh I'll see all those outputs and I should probably go ahead and delete this one that it it created before no reason to have that there so that's still up I chose current display extent but as soon as you choose it it, it actually calculates what the current display and changes it to add specified below. So I didn't enter into these values, and I don't care if your values are exactly the same as mine, as long as they encompass the, just zoom out so that you can see the entire study area. So your values can be slightly different. And we can add all of these data sets and they should all have the exact same extent and the same cell size because we set those up uh, in the environments. See, see how I, there's the, uh, there's the roads is the top layer right now. But if I turn that off, I get the distance to the, um, agri I mean, sorry, the industrial areas. See how it gets brighter over here because only industrial areas over there. Then if I turn off that, I get the, Brightness values for the uh, the, uh, the agriculture areas, and then finally the town. So that that looks like it's working. Um, yes, that's all I changed. Did did, uh, did you get a different uh, map? Okay. So um, you do, if you try to run it uh, from, if you, you do, if you have, if, if you try to run it from the, from here, you're going to have to change it on every operator. If you try to hit the run button, is that what you did? Uh, no. But, no? Uh... You shouldn't have to if you go over to catalog and then double click habitat suitability model. You should only have to change it in this dialog right here. That's what I that's what I did. So yeah, if if you do run the model this way, you'd have to it is possible it actually wasn't possible in ArcMap to even do this. So in Arc GIS Pro, you do have the ability to set the environments for every individual operation. You didn't have that in ArcMap. So if you want to do that, you could do that there, but to me that's a big pain. So I save it and do it the way that I used to do it in ArcMap and just run it from uh, this window. You double click on it, you run it from here, you set the environment once, and it, and it, it does that for all of the tools that are in your model. Yes, you change the uh, extent to current display extent, and you change the cell size, which is less important. The cell size is less important. But change that to 100. I think the default that it comes up with is like 80 or something, so it's pretty close. That's fine. No. Nope, I'm just, I'm just showing the intermediate step. But you will notice that you, you, you don't even see these because it doesn't actually store those on disk. Um, so you shouldn't, you shouldn't see these four data sets. You only see... So these four data sets are, the, are, na are now... We're just starting our model. These are the factors that are going to go into uh, our model of creating a, uh, a data set that, uh, that represents the areas that are the least suitable for a nature preserve. So those are our factors right there. I'm going to delete those. We don't, we don't need them, as I mentioned. That was your question. So now the next step is, and I don't think in the lab I actually ran, ran it. The next step, which is the last step that we'll do together, is that we're going to um, do the, um, we're going to do the um, raster calculator operation. The reason I do this as a raster calculator operation 
is that um, it's, uh, I'm going to add four of them, is that it's, you know, it's a, it's a big formula, not a big formula, but it would take three, it would take three tools to do this whole formula, uh, and you would still need a raster calculator function, I think. Okay. So what we can do here is in each of these raster calculator operations, if you click inside of them, and then um, right here, I think you can cut and paste it from the lab. Maybe you can't. You can't cut and paste that from the lab, but you can get close. You can cut and paste this. See this right here? Oh, and there's one tool that I, I actually forgot. This tool is actually really similar. This conditional tool is really similar to the set null tool. Except for instead of setting things to null, it says, okay, if something is true, give it this value. And if it's false, give it this value. If I'm, every cell, I'm going to look at the value, and, and it's going to go through this criteria. If it's true, it's going to get value A, and if it's false, it's going to get value B. So it's kind of like set null. Set null worked like that, too, where we said, if this criteria is, is true, give it a null. If not, give it this other value. So it's, they're really similar, except for we're not saying null. We're saying both values are available to change. So the conditional operator, the con operator, is actually used a lot. Another way to say it is it's the if-then operator uh, in ArcGIS. And so what we want to do here um, is to change the XXXs to mean the, um, uh, the, the particular factor for that class. So we have the distance to the towns, the distance to roads, the distance to industrial areas, and the distance to uh, agricultural areas. Those are the factors. So each, each time we're going to replace the factors with these triple X's, and we're going to replace the appropriate uh, distance values with the ZZZs, and the appropriate factor score with the YYYs. Okay. So let's look at the table, because we need that. To, to replace these values. So here's the table. So the YYYs are going to be the, the is going to be 20, and the ZZZs is going to be 300. And then I'll explain what this math does once we get the formula typed out. So this will be 20. This will be, or did I get that backwards? I got it backwards. Sorry. So so uh, uh, 3,000. And this will be 20. Okay. Yep. And that'll also be uh, 3,000. So sorry, I, 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 I said that backwards, but I'll explain the math here in a second. So we're going to go with towns first. Oops. It'll, it'll change, yeah. It, it's because my, my quotes were actually slightly different types of quotes. Oops. This, it's probably better to just delete the whole thing right there, this part, and hit towns again. All right. So it should look like that. I'll make this bigger so that it all goes in one line. And then you actually want the output to also have a unique name. And so the next thing, I, the last thing I would do is, is call this, I'll, I'll call this uh, rating for towns. And I'll call the other one rating for roads and so on. Let's think about this math here. So what we're doing is we're saying, remember this is the if statement. If this statement is true, then give it this value. If it's not true, then give it the value of zero. It says one minus, sorry. Yeah. So what we're doing is saying if the distance is less than 3,000, if it's less than 3,000 meters away, if that's true, then we're going to assign it a negative rating score. And that negative rating score is just going to be related to the distance. It's a linear, so it's going to go, uh, the, the higher the distance, the, 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 uh, the less bad it is. Or the lower the distance, the more unsuitable it is. 
So if, the, if, if we get a value like 0 here, 0 divided by 3,000 is 0. So 1 minus 3,000, or 1 minus 0 is 1. Okay? If we get a value of 3,000, 3,000 divided by 3,000 is what? 1. So we get 1 minus 1 is 0. So right at the edge, in other words, 3,000 meters away, we're going to get the same value that we're assigning everything beyond 3,000. So what we're doing is, is, is anywhere where the value is 0, in other words, inside the negative thing, okay, the negative externality, inside that, the value is going to be 0. And then as we travel away, the value will, uh, I'm sorry, well, the value starts out at 0, but now it's going to be, it's going to be 1, and it's going to trail all the way off to 0 as you get all the way out to the very edge. So we're, we're flopping it so that 0 becomes 1, and then it trails off as you get 3,000 meters away to 0. So it's a linear scale, 0 out to 1. And then we're flipping it around, so it's 1 out to 0. Then we have to multiply it by the, by the actual rating score, in this case 20. So towns are, are less problematic than, let's say, industrial areas. Industrial areas, we really want to stay away from them. So we have a higher, we have a higher negative score. These are all negative scores. This time. So these are twice as bad as those. So, so um, the first part of this equation just turns everything from being um, zero to the distance to being... 1 out to the maximum distance, and that's 0. So 0 to 1, I mean, sorry, 1 to 0, and then we multiply it by whatever the, the value is so that now they'll range from 20 down to 0 instead of 1 down to 0. So that's what this, this math did. That's what that uh, conditional statement and math did. So if we hit OK here, it will actually automatically link these two up. In uh, our math, that didn't, that didn't, it didn't create that little uh, uh, link. It just, it, it still worked right. It just didn't create the link to show you. It wasn't like smart enough to figure out that you chose that that layer. Uh, but in our uh, in our catalog, it does that. All right. What's that? It should link up. Did it not link up for you? If it didn't link up for you, then you probably didn't include this. Are they in quotes? I can come look. Yeah. It works best to just... I think it works best. I'm going to copy this. Control C. And put this down here in the second one. It works best to actually delete it and double click on the layer. Because then it'll... It'll format it correctly. See how it put the quotes around it for you? So I'm going to backspace, double click roads. And now I've got to change the distance and the decay value, or the, rest, the, the rating value. So 30 and 2000. I'm going to change this to 30, this to 2000, this to 2000. Now, out. Oh, and I'm going to change the output. I've got to call this something different. I'll call it uh, rating rate rating roads. So now I have that one and that one done. So now I need to do this again. And again, I can just copy and paste it, but I need to replace everything. So towns now gets placed with the change to the IA. And the, the parentheses and everything do matter here. Go back to the table. The industrial areas, 40 and 3,000. So 3,000 is good, but I need to change this to 40. And then change the name to rating, under, well, I don't need to do underscore, IA. And then the last one, you may not have gone quite as fast here. Uh, is the 
Oh, remember I called it distance to agriculture. So um, when I said that it, it doesn't really matter what you call it, you do need to know what you called it. Uh, so this is the name of the variable because what... Maybe I should have explained that too. What this, um, what this means, this, per, this uh, quote percent, then the name is actually called, uh, the, the terminology for it is called inline variable substitution. In other words, when this, when this executes, it's going, to, um, it's going to execute this, and then it's going to get to here. And when it gets to here, and it executes this um, tool, it's going to look for um, the variable that's named this and get the proper um, path to that variable and insert it into there. So that, you know, what the path, what's the path to there? Over, over, over. So here's the path to the agricultural data set. Oh, it's this one. Not sure. So it's going to get this value and it's actually going to insert it and put it right there. That's, that's what that that's what that means in model builder. So because model builder can't rely on that even existing right now, so you, you can't put the, the path there because that file doesn't exist at this moment. But you're telling it, yeah, it'll exist before you run. Don't 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 worry about it. Okay. All right, and then I'm going to call this uh, uh, I'm going to call this a rating. Ag. So now this should work. Now if I if I just go right back to the catalog and try to run this, what's the, what's the problem going to be? What do I what what other steps did I leave out? What do you think? I have some steps I left out. If I just hit run right now, there's there's actually two things. Yeah. So one thing is I didn't save it. So I gotta save it, and and it does it kind of gets confused if I try to actually have it open when I save. So hit save, then now go back and try to run it. So that was the first thing. What's the second thing? If I want uh, everything to have the proper extent, what do I have to do? Yep, set the environment. Current display extent, and then. Set the cell size. I'm going to set it at 100 again. That doesn't matter as much. But all right, now I'm going to run this. Yeah. So now it's running one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different operations. I'm just going to show the final operation. I'm going to show the results of this, and and all you need to do is add a um, all you need to do is add a cell st cell statistics operation right here, and hook it up right, and you'll be done. Um, but uh, let's look at the results so far. So I'm going to go back to the catalog. Notice that when I refresh this, this is what I was talking about earlier, uh, Nick. See, now I don't have those intermediate data sets there. I only have the, the results, the things at the end of every model. So when you put the cell statistics in and link everything up, you're only actually going to get one output because everything else is intermediate. You're only going to get that, that final output. Now, ArcMap used to work a little bit differently than that, but uh, I kind of like it how it only shows you the output uh, unless you change that. I'm going to throw all these guys in here. If what's not showing up? These four data sets? Yeah, you might have to refresh. Uh, or you ran the model without saving. Um, but we'll, we'll look at that in just a second. I'm, uh, I'll, uh, so these are the ratings for the towns. See how... Near the towns, it's really not a good place to put a nature preserve. And as you get further away, it gets to be uh, less, less and less bad. 
Okay. Same with, uh, here's the roads. And here is the industrial areas. And here is the agricultural areas. So basically, you're going to run cell statistics um, and, uh, and calculate the, uh, the overall rating score for each of these. So you would go back here and you would run the uh, cell statistics operation uh, right here and you'd get these to feed into it. Um, right? So if you, if, you have, if you need help, let me know. Um, it sounds like some of you already want to ask some questions. And so I can handle that on an individual basis, but if it's something that I think everybody needs to know, I'll just... I'll just uh, I'll just say when you ask me. Okay, so um, I'm going to go ahead and end the... Uh